you'd be able to drive a, a few dozen times a year, but after you go beyond that quota, then you'd have to pay a fine each time you uh, drove outside of your sector into, into another sector of operation. With an impressive background in the financial industry, including a senior director role at Moody's Analytics, Mark Joffe brings a wealth of expertise to the table. With a current role with the esteemed Reason Foundation and the Cato Institute, his op-eds have been in prestigious publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the Fiscal Times, and the National Review. Today, he joins us to understand the issue of 15-minute cities and the government mandating of your travel, the potential banking collapse in the West, cryptocurrency, and a paper he wrote on provincial debt in Canada, a leading voice in the realm of government finance and state policy, Mark Joff. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. Well, Mark, it is so good to have you on Return to Reason today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Mark, there's there's so many things that um, I hope we get to in today's program, but one of the things I would love to start off on is first, can you explain to me this idea of 15-minute cities, what it's all about, and, and we'll kind of go from there. Sure. So a 15-minute city is the idea that uh, for the benefit of the climate and for the benefit of your personal health, that it's good for you to be able to live within 15 minutes by walking or bike of anything that's important to you, including shopping social activities, coffee shop, potentially work and so forth. So uh, eliminating uh, car trips by being close to the things that are important to you, that's the idea of a 15 minute city. And so what about this is a hot topic? Like so it, it, on the surface level, I go, well, that makes a lot of sense, no problem. What is it that's uh, happening with this idea that's being distorted? Well, I mean, there's a there's been over the last uh, 20 or so years an increasing focus on you know, what, what can we do to uh, mitigate the effects of climate change? How can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And I think uh, some people who have become very concerned about this are turning to, you know, more and more coercive uh, means for achieving you know, uh, climate or greenhouse reduction, greenhouse gas reduction goals. And so uh, we've seen a case in Oxford, England, where uh, they've come up with a plan that's, uh, seems pretty totalitarian. So the idea is that uh, to achieve the goals of people living within a 15 minute type of environment, uh, the city is being split up into a series of zones and you're not really supposed to leave the zone that you're uh, you're in except for like, extraordinary reasons. This is a real thing? Yeah, so the idea would be that you have to pay a fine. Um, you, you'd be able to drive a, a few dozen times a year, but after you, go beyond that quota, then you'd have to pay a fine each time you uh, drove outside of your sector into into another sector of Oxford. That Okay, so this is where the issue arises. You are, you are it sounds like something North Korea would be doing. It yes. just, it's absolute, that, that's wild. Because I was gonna say the idea of it makes sense. Minimize gas, cars, get on a bike, get healthy. Sure, like I can see all the benefits of keeping things right. close. But to restrict citizens into a zone, like what if my mom or mother-in-law or father-in-law are, aren't well and I need to take care of them and I have to go daily or every other day or who's going to do that? Like, so I could, oh, okay. I actually didn't know that this was actually a reality of what they were talking about with yeah. this 15-minute city idea. That's wild. Right. And that's engendered a lot of, uh, a lot of protests against this. And it almost seems as though the, the climate seems to be higher priority than freedoms, than individuals, than, than the, the, just the Canadian, or I guess whatever citizen is dealing with that. Yeah, uh, this seems to be something that goes throughout the English-speaking world and the the you know advanced economies generally. You just see a lot of these plans for you know, restricting people's lives in the name in the name of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And you know, I think <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who are concerned about climate change and who you know want to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And I think there are there are ways to encourage people to do that voluntarily without these heavy-handed, top-down coercive measures that we're seeing. Well, yeah, for sure. And I think the real question that isn't, maybe they would say it's definitive, is the you, one thing I've noticed is that they've changed the name of from climate change to, um, uh, the, the name of climate change has changed a number of times in order to fit kind of whatever it is they're talking about, where... Um, I, it I had been global warming. Global warming. That's what I was thinking. Yes. Global warming now yes. with climate change. Well, it's going, well, which right. one is it? And and which one is pertaining? And then there's this obvious push for electric cars, but 
what's now rising to the top is, well, first of all, in California, one of the things that I came across was that they had to do rolling blackouts in order to help because the power grid couldn't support all these electric cars and that they're asking people to not plug in their cars at certain times. And you're going, what? Like, is <laughs> has no one thought beyond this? No one's thought this far ahead. And here we are doing rolling blackouts. And I can't imagine the impact that that would have on society and people and health and hospitals. And uh, you can't even, the, the list goes on. Yeah, California has an issue where they've really politicized the whole electricity uh, or power market. So um, the idea is that we want people in California, which is where I'm talking to you from, you know, to uh, not use fossil fuels. Yeah. So uh, one thing that they're doing right now in the in the San Francisco Bay Area is uh, planning to uh, eliminate uh, you know, a natural gas powered um, water heaters and eventually natural gas powered stoves. Yep. So the idea is that your water heater, your stove, all your home appliances will have to be replaced and, uh, uh, you know, with, with electrical uh, appliances. And then of course we have a lot more people driving Teslas and other electric vehicles. And there are more and more incentives, both at the federal level and the state level, you know, to get people to make that switch. But at the same time, there's a lot of reluctance to put on new power generating capacity unless it's the right kind of yeah. power generating capacity. So we've had one nuclear power plant that was going to close in 2025, but the governor realized that that just didn't make any sense because it was providing 8%. It is providing 8% of the state's power needs. So yeah. the that's gotten a stay of execution, but it's really you know impossible to build any more natural gas powered plants, certainly not coal. I wouldn't even advocate for a coal power plant. We have natural gas, which is plentiful and relatively clean. We should be able to have those. But the only kinds of electrical power generating facilities that are permissible are wind and solar. Yeah. And that takes up a lot of space. Yeah. And ultimately, and ultimately, I, I think it's very hard to replace traditional, uh, you know, traditional sources of, of power, of electrical power with these newer sources in a very short period of time. And yet that's the kind of policy that we have. Well, yeah, because correct me if I'm wrong, but is not coal one of the largest re, like productions of electricity? Coal? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. As, Which is and especially once you get out of the Western world, right? Oh, China for, and the, you know India have a lot of coal powered uh, plants. Well, and, and then then it's it, it, add. and then it brings the question of uh, if if we're talking about country inferiority or superiority, and you're going to talk about whether one country cripples themselves and the other couldn't care less about climate change. We're, we're putting ourselves in a position of weakness to other countries that, that maybe it was, so there's a, there's a dance to dance there as well. Um, and it all. Just... Yeah. If I could, if I could key in on that, that's one point I make a lot about California. And I, I suspect the numbers for Canada are not that different because California's population is pretty close to that of Canada's. Yeah. Yeah. So in California, you know, we account for 1% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So whatever we do, we just went back to the stone age and nobody used, uh, any kind of fossil fuel yeah. at all, the world would still be generating 99% of the greenhouse gas emissions that it currently generates. And then you know, China and India will grow a little more and uh, uh, add some more uh, coal powered plants or whatever, and that 1% will be wiped out. So I suspect the numbers are probably not too different in Canada. Well, yeah, and, and I think that's a question that's not being asked enough. I, yesterday I was um, jumping around on YouTube and I was watching a lot of the Ken Senator Kennedy question um, the federal reserve not the federal reserve the federal investigator in ah, whatever it was but he was invest he was questioning a lot of these people and so i was jumping through a bunch of these videos and one of the ones he was questioning about was um was about greenhouse gas emissions and he was questioning saying if every car that we have on the road today turned to electric this moment what would be the impact what would be the positive impact down the road and he and his re actual scientific result was 0.0001% by the year 2100 and so he was saying <laughs> That is such a minute drop in the ocean that yet we're trying to convert all of our industries, all of our people, all of our power grids, all of our everything for such a minimal um, effect. Like, what are we doing here? We're, well, and, and then not to mention if we go into the direction about cobalt and mining that and, and how it's unethically done in other countries and the effect that that's having and so on and so forth. It's just a, it, it almost seems as though it's, it's just, I guess maybe I'll ask you this. Why is it that they're pushing this if it's if it's negligible, the difference they're going to make? Where's where's this coming from? 
Well, you know, I, I as a policy analyst, I, I sort of like to just talk about the facts of the policies as opposed to ascribing motives. I think if I, you know, if I want to, you know, sort of steel man the other side, I think, you know, uh, there are people who are legitimately really, really, really worried about uh, the, you know, uh, anthropogenic climate change and anything, anything that can be done is seen as, as, a, as a positive. And I think another argument, if I was on the other side on this, I would make is that, well, yes, it's true that Western countries don't contribute that much overall, but we're very affluent and we set an example for the rest of the world. So um, how can we go to China and India and say, reduce your, your greenhouse gas emissions unless we're doing as, as much as we can? I don't really think those kinds of arguments are really that effective. I think China will do what China wants absolutely, to do. Absolutely. Yeah. But I can, I mean, I certainly uh, can see how uh, well-intentioned people, you know, would uh, come to the kinds of conclusions that we, we've come to. I mean, if I, if, <laughs> if I can pivot off of that, you know, you think about what happened in the, in the, during the COVID era. Yeah. Um, I don't know about people in your audience. I suspect they they probably think similar to the way I did, but I thought lockdowns were terrible. I thought vaccine mandates were terrible, mm -hmm. all these things, but I certainly understand why people advocated them without necessarily having an ill intent. I think they they just thought that from a public health point of view, this was, these were the kinds of measures that were needed to save lives. Unfortunately, I think uh, they they were largely ineffective and in many cases backfired. But yes. I certainly understand why people, you know, for sure. And I believe think in some of these things at the very beginning, I didn't know a person who was against it all, like at the very beginning. But then once you started to see the numbers and the data and the stats and it, you could start to make an informed opinion, that's when all of a sudden the questions started coming. But then the part that was the biggest red flag to me was when the questions were coming, you were being shut down saying, don't don't ask those questions. And you're going, well, <laughs> But which 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 is why I, I I question about what is the intention between the the greenhouse gas emission policies because policy just is essentially and and, and correct me if I'm wrong policy is just is driving a public opinion public uh, what well, not public opinion but what we believe to be the best road to go down so that we can enforce what's healthy what's safe what's good what's productive and so on so policy would drive what's needed for the people would you agree? Yeah, but I mean, I and I think I would sort of reverse the thing. First, you you uh, affect public opinion, and then policies come out of that. Yes. Or okay. you know, you might put forward a policy and then uh, try to drive public opinion toward that okay. kind of solution. I think um, the thing that really disturbs me, and and I guess we'll get into it later. I I do come out of a financial industry background, and I worked for a credit rating agency for nine years, and you know, I think. Uh, one thing that I really learned from that experience is that it's just very important to you know get your facts straight and make decisions about you know, what the credit quality is of a state or a province based on just having all of the facts. Yeah. And when I look at what's happened with COVID and and when I now look at what's going on with climate change, although I think it started even before COVID, is that the facts are not presented in a complete way or an unbiased way so that the viewer can make a decision. So if you're watching many mainstream media outlets, you you get just sort of one side of the story and you don't hear the other side. And a lot of times that involves, you know, not having all of the facts because yeah. the fact, usually, I mean, I, like I have a narrative. There's things that I, I believe Everybody I'm, I'm against lockdowns, I'm for the free market and so forth. Yeah. I have to admit, sometimes a fact comes out that doesn't support my narrative. Which but is the last thing I want to do is suppress that. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to understand. Well, how do I, do I have to admit that that's maybe um, a drawback, and I just have to, I have to retreat to an argument that's saying, well, my solution is not perfect, but it's it's less bad than than the other solutions. But instead, it's so it seems to be so much easier for one side to simply, you know, uh, uh, send all of these uh, the, these facts down the rabbit hole so that nobody nobody hears about them. They get one side and then they're able to, you know, uh, uh, enlist public opinion in support of a, of a particular position. And I, I just think that's that's that has very dangerous long term effects for society, being able to have a very full discussion. I think that's probably, you know, one of the kinds of things that, you know, your network contributes to is, you know, being able to uh, being able to platform alternate voices and hearing all sides. I just think it's very, very, very important for human progress.
And, and you're, you couldn't be more right. Like that's, that's why this show is called return to reason is that our goal is to, to discuss and talk. And, and, and just, as you said, like if, if an opinion comes in, that's different to what you are biased and we're all biased in some way or form, um, you have to question it and go, is this truth? Is it not? Why is it? Why am I leaning towards this and not, you know, you mentioned about the financial world um, that you've been a part of. Um, there's a lot happening in the, in the last recent future with banks collapsing and actually in, in California. Um, yes. uh, there's a lot that I would love to ask your opinion on, but um, what do you think is going on with the financial horizon? Where are we at? What's going on? Is there uncertainty? Is it strong? Is it, what's it, what's it looking like? Well, you know, we had, we had, really a period of a, of close to 40 years where yeah. interest rates were on a secular downtrend. Yeah. You know, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when, when I was in high school and college, that uh, in the US, it, you could pay up to 20% for a mortgage, right? Wow. And uh, after Paul Volcker broke the back of inflation in the US in the early 1980s, interest rates gradually declined. Now it wasn't steady. Sometimes they would go back up, but we talk about you know cyclical and secular trends. The secular trend was down. Yep. So now it seems, you know, and you only know in the rear view mirror, right? But it now seems that that 40 year mega trend is over and we're returning to, um, you know, more quote unquote normal interest rates from the eighties and nineties. Yep. And, you know, unfortunately a lot of the economy, including banks became used to this low and declining interest rate regime. And now we're going through the adjustment pain. So like we, you know, the case of say Silicon Valley Bank, they, you know, they had a lot of uh, exposure to long-term debt securities. Uh, you usually hear it mentions that their treasuries, a lot of them were, uh, you know, government backed mortgage backed securities or you know, government guaranteed mortgage backed securities, I would say from places like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, so there wasn't really default risk associated with those. What, what there was, was interest rate risk yeah. and they didn't hedge it. And so as a result, uh, they suffered a very large mark to market loss on their portfolio. And then they were unable to recapitalize to offset that loss. Yeah. And so they were forced into liquidation. Yeah. And that's, and that's when people started withdrawing cash and they couldn't even actually, and so they and then that was the beginning of the collapse, but there was a number of coll collapses that happened. So is this, is this due to um, lack of wisdom from management and leadership within the bank internally, just over leveraging, not making the right moves could, could have, have been avoided, or is this speaking to a larger picture of our financial future in the American and Canadian markets? Well, you know, I worked in, I worked in bank risk management, including at uh, CIBC uh, back in the nineties and the early aughts. And I know that we were concerned with credit ri credit risk and we were concerned with interest rate risk. Yeah. So the whole idea that you would set yourself up to fail if interest rates went the wrong way is really anathema to me. And I think, you know, people of most large banks, at least when uh, at least the peers that I had back then, you know, would definitely say that what happened at Silicon Valley Bank was really a very serious case of of mismanagement. Now. That was 20 years ago, and it could just be that generally people have become so used to this regime of low interest rates that they forgot that that there was there was an alternate reality. Yeah, but wouldn't 2008 have been any sign of uh, any lesson learned of any kind, or did they have no relation whatsoever? Well, 2008 in is interesting because uh, even though that was the post Alan Greenspan era, that was a definite case of the Greenspan put. The idea that if the market has a meltdown, you can guarantee that the Fed's going to come in and uh, yeah. provide additional liquidity and lower interest rates. So well, and, and that's, that's when we got to the zero. You know, we got we floored the federal the the uh, uh, federal funds rate at close to zero, and it, it was very hard to get back above zero until this inflationary you know scenario happened in 2022. Which brings on so many more questions in my mind about banks being too large and when are they too large and. Are they there? And, and then what I'm alluding to with that is too large to fail, I guess I would say. Um, and then where you can see kind of the, I don't even know what to call it, the free man <laughs> trying yes. to solve the problem on their own with cryptocurrencies and getting decentralized. And now the banks are trying to jump on board and <laughs> there's a lot of moving parts. Um, so I'll let you answer that. What's your thoughts right. on happening there? Well, uh, interesting, too big to fail. So like if we think about how the US banking system compares to the Canadian banking system. So yeah. 
you know, in the US, we have our big four. Yeah. I think in Canada, I'm not sure if it's four or five, but there are real, you know, there are, there are just a, a handful of really, really large banks. Yeah. But the difference between the United States and Canada is the United States then has the second tier of pretty large banks that are not among the largest. And it's in this category, you know, in the 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 10 to 20th largest bank range that you have things like Silicon Valley Bank and First yeah. Republic Bank, which both uh, you know have uh have had problems. I don't know if I want to go so far as to say FRB was a failure and was just a sort of a shotgun wedding with JP Morgan. Yeah. But so we have this vulnerable second tier of banks that are, you know, are, aren't able to handle situations like this, the you know, high interest rates and so forth. So I think that's in a way Canada, which is pretty much you know fully dependent on these two big to fail banks, may in fact be safer. Although then the next problem becomes well, when once the government bails it out, where does the, where does the government get the money to to that's, pay for that? That's and so I, then it can change into a sovereign, you know, a sovereign debt crisis. And that that actually happened, I think, with uh, Iceland, which is a very small country. Yep. Back in the 2007, the lead up to the 2008 financial crisis, their banks went south, and then the, that undermined the credit of the of the whole country. Yeah. So that that definitely is is something to to worry about. You know, if CIBC or or RBC, you know, they get into trouble, and the Canada has to inject a lot of liquidity uh, into them. You know, where where's Canada going to get that money? Um, one of the questions I would love to get your opinion on is. When it comes to, and I don't know if this is just all talk or if, if it's being mag greater magnified than it actually is, is about a lot of countries seem to be wanting to pull away from the, using the U.S. dollar as their standard. Um, if that gets a lot of wind under their wings, it could be dangerous for our markets and housing markets and banks and interest rates and so on. Um, is there any validity to that or what's your thoughts happening with this? Maybe less dangerous for Canada than the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think, you know, with respect to the United States, so uh, we have really abused our um, status as the world's reserve currency yeah. to impose all sorts of sanctions on all sorts of countries and individuals around the world. Yeah. And I think a block of countries, you know, associated with the BRICS have become fed up with uh, with the overuse by the U.S. of, of sanctions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that does start to jeopardize the uh, U.S. dollar's standing. And for the U.S. dollar is a long way to go down because the the natural rival to the U.S. dollar is the renminbi, and that's in a country that has capital controls. And one of the advantages of the U.S. dollar is that it's it's not owned by a government that's employing capital controls. So I think I think we I think we can do more <laughs> to abuse it. Yeah. But I do think that there's ultimately a limit. And I think, you know, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, I think, you know, these these countries are going to find ways of, uh, of Brazil. I think Brazil has been very active in this, of circumventing the dollar more and more. And I, I do think that uh, the U.S. needs to be more careful with its foreign policy. Yeah, uh, I think you're, you're spot on the money. I feel like they first just need to figure out their leadership struggles, <laughs> <laughs> which, which will seem to uh, sort out a lot of this. Um, you know, in in one of our when you and I first uh, connected, you mentioned something about in 2012 the Canadian provincial debt. Yes. Um, what do you, do you want to just expound on that? Sure. So uh, I did a study for the Macdonald Laurier Institute, questioning whether the federal government would bail out a province that had um, excessive debt and got into a, a financial crisis. Yeah. And I think that there were two things in the study that were informative for. You know, my fellow geeks in Canada who are interested in um, in in subsovereign debt. One is I found that it wasn't just Alberta that defaulted during the depression. I'm not sure if you're aware that Alberta defaulted during the depression, but it did. It, it actually turned out that all four Western provinces defaulted. Yeah. Um. So that, there was that learning, and then the other thing was I had uh, developed and implemented a model to estimate the probability. That certain prov that each province would default over a course of 30 years, and there was a surprising outcome, which is I said that at the time in 2012 that Alberta was at the most risk of defaulting. Yeah, and the general reception to that was very negative. Was Sorry, it, go ahead. Would that be because it's dependence on on minerals and resources? Yeah, I'll I, I'll get to that. So, 
at the time, and I, you know, <laughs> I don't know if uh, your your audience will remember this, but at the time, Alberta was a uh, uh, was a net surplus province, and it had really no no net debt. Yeah. Uh, now I see it's eighty seven billion. <laughs> so, I think um, I think I had uh, uh, some valid insights at that point. So there were two reasons why the model that I developed led me to that conclusion. One is um, the volatility of uh, of oil prices, which I had embedded in the model at the time that everyone was so sanguine about Alberta's uh, credit was a time where I think the uh, oil price was $100 a barrel. And of course, yeah, we had you know, a lot of drops after that. And then, of course, it's been increases as well. Yeah. So there was that. And then second, and I, I haven't updated myself on this. You know, you might know better than I. How, uh, Alberta at the time was projected to have the worst problem with population aging. So by the time you got to the end of my analysis, which at the time would have been in 2041 and 2042, the dependency, the old age dependency ratio in Alberta was the worst. And because in Canada, you have the, you know, uh, the, the pro provincial run, you know, Medicare, uh, that, that introduces a huge burden onto the province, because if you have a lot of people who are older, who are using a lot of medical services, that's going to balloon the cost of the, of the Medicare program in, the, in that particular province. So because of the volatility of oil prices and because of the, um, Population aging; those are the reasons why I had the negative uh, view of uh, Alberta. Yeah, absolutely, and those, and those make a lot of sense. I would be, I, I wonder if that is still a relevant study towards the senior population. I, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like we have that. I, I know that there's a few places down in like Lethbridge, Alberta, that has some of the highest senior population there. I know that for sure. Um, but it, again, it a bit. It, like one of the questions that I wonder about is um, something that we have up in Canada is called equalization payments. And I don't know if that was accounted for in some of this, but like over time, the numbers are just ast astronomically huge from Alberta and vice versa. Like it, there are all sorts of provinces trading funds in order to benefit the country and, and so on. Um, was that factored into this? Is that if they... Well, I, I mean, I just uh, rolled forward from the, the budget. I think I had the 2011, 2012 budget or actuals. So yep. the equalization payments would have been baked into that. But I didn't make equalization payments a variable. And that's probably, that would have been, that would have been a, a definite improvement to have uh, I've done that. I mean, I guess that a lot of that, you know, money is going from Alberta and British Columbia to the um, eastern provinces, right? Yes, so they're the ones problem. who like yep. New Brunswick and... Yep. Newfoundland and Labrador, those are the ones who are on the receiving end of those payments. Very, very much so. Well, um, Mark, it's been, uh, you are you are such a vast wealth of knowledge and I appreciate your time today and joining us today. And uh, um, I, I would just encourage anybody to, to is there anywhere our, our viewers can see some of your content, see some of your studies, or is there a website maybe that they, they can go to? Well, I'm a, I'm a policy analyst at the Cato Institute and we have uh each uh, scholar at Cato has uh, a page with all of their recent contributions. So if you go to Cato.org and look up Mark Joffe, that's two Fs and one E, Excellent. you'll you'll find me there and you'll see all the things that I've uh, been been writing about, including that uh, a, a blog post about 15 minute cities and one about uh, California's uh, electricity shortage. Yeah. And, and that's what I want to share with our viewers is that we were barely able to scratch the surface of a lot of these topics. And and Mark's got so much knowledge on each of them that we could probably do a show five times the length of this on each one of those topics. And so I want to encourage you guys to go to those um, to go to those links. We'll have them up on the screen for you so that you can just see what it is and get much further depth into each one of these topics. I want to say thank you, Mark, for uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth knowledge and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking become an insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.